All right. So uh, I just want to say hello and welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us live from Tallahassee, Florida tonight. Uh, we are Florida State University's higher education program, and we are really excited to have an opportunity to showcase our program um, to everybody who's here tonight and even to folks who can't show um, and be here tonight. That's totally okay. Um, we are excited to showcase our program, our institution, and some of our students and faculty. We are recording this video, so we would ask that um, all live attendees mute themselves to prevent any unscheduled interruptions. Um, and if you'd rather not be on the recording, it is now would be a good time to, to mute your camera as well. So um, first, we wanted to start with our land acknowledgement. Uh, we think it's important to our program um, to uh, we know the importance of acknowledging the past to work towards a better future for us all. And so just wanted to say we are joining you today from the indigenous lands of the Appalachian Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, the Miccosukee Tribe of Florida, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Uh, we highlight and play, pay respect to this history because we understand how the state of Florida and Florida State University came to be settled on these lands. We recognize this land as scarred with a painful past of enslavement, settler colonial violence, the desolation of culture, and the forced removal of indigenous bodies. Despite this, we respect the cultural and ceremonial practices these indigenous nations maintain in and around Tallahassee today. As educators, we honor the knowledge of these tribes and their people and acknowledge that indigenous students, faculty, and administrators are vital to higher education. We embrace the decolonization of our educational system and commit to disrupting suppressive systems through the exploration of many truths and lived experiences and creating room for those who are often excluded by harmful colonial erasures in our practice and pedagogy. My name is Kendra Bumpus and I am the higher education GA. I'm a doctoral student and I will be kind of your MC for the night if I can give myself a cool title. Uh, um, we, we want to go ahead and uh, let you all know our schedule of events for the program. Uh, we will be, again, recording so that students who cannot join us tonight will still be able to get good information. Um, but in that vein, uh, we also wanted to offer the opportunity for anybody who is here with us tonight, if you want to submit live questions for us and some of our students, um, please know that you can do that in the chat. We would love to have those questions and be able to answer them for you. So um, first, we are going to go through our master's overview. Um, we are going to have two guest speakers tonight. One is Alan Clay Jr. Hello. And the other is Charlotte Hayes. Hello. They are second years in our master's program. Um, our first years are actually in class at the moment. So uh, we have our second years, second years here with us tonight. And so we'll take around 20 minutes to go over specifically the master's program. And then uh, we'll move on to doctoral students. And so that is Ricardo Perita. Hello. Um, and me. You're stuck with me. Um, we're in, <laughs> Ricardo and I are in different programs, but we thought it would be a good opportunity to talk to you all about both the master's and the doctoral students. And then a little towards the end of the program, um, really around the 745-ish mark, we will be having two of our faculty, uh, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Tamara Bertrand Jones, um, who will be joining us. Uh, Dr. Bob Schwartz is my advisor. Um, he's pretty awesome. He has been in a lot of different positions around the program. And Dr. Bertrand Jones is our associate chair for the ELPS department. And so we are very excited to have them um, joining us today. So that way, again, if you students have any questions, you can feel free to ask them. So I am going to turn it over to Charlotte and Alan. Um, I'm going to ask both of you to tell us your names, your pronouns, uh, where you come from, as well as, um, you know, your undergrad, and then tell us where your assistantship is. Okay, I'll go first. Um, hello, everyone. So great to meet you virtually. My name is Charlotte Hayes, as you'll see there. Um, <laughs> my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am originally from Alexandria, Virginia. It's about 10 miles outside Washington, DC. 
I went to Virginia Tech for undergrad, which is in Blacksburg, Virginia, Southwest Virginia. None of you look like Hokies, but that's fine. Um, we're doing great. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm a second year in this higher education master's program. My current assistantship is um, with advising first. So kind of more on the academic side of a university uh, advising students as the name implies. Um, did I hit all of the points? I'm always nervous I miss something, you know? No, you got them, straight up. Wonderful. Alan, your turn. <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> my name is Alan Clay Jr. I am a, well, obviously, second year graduate student. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. I am from Cincinnati, Ohio. I attended my undergraduate institution at a small private liberal arts school named Davidson College, located in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my current assistantship is in the Department of Student Conduct and Community Standards. So very law and policy type of things. Always interesting though, but yeah. Fantastic. So um, Charlotte and Alan, if you don't mind, Tell, tell us a little bit about your journey. What were you looking for in a, in a master's program? Why did you choose FSU? Um, and what's something that maybe surprised you about Florida State? Alan, do you want me to go first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So why what there, there were a lot of questions there but what was i looking for in a master's program for me the biggest thing was a feeling a vibe that might be different than how other people will do it but i wanted to be in a place that i was going to feel comfortable and welcomed and included uh, so I applied to a bunch of places all over the country, just kind of was like, yeah, let's see what happens. Um, got into a couple, went to an uh, interview at a couple of places, two places. I interviewed at two places in person back when that was a thing. And I really couldn't determine which one I liked. I was like, they're both very similar. Like the, the, the programs are going to be pretty similar. The classes you take are going to be pretty similar no matter where you go. But I kept finding myself saying, I think I'd be happier at Florida State. I think I'd be happier at Florida State because I liked the people that I was at visiting days with. I don't want to say a lot more than the other ones, but I felt a lot more connected to the people that I went through visiting days. Um, and i uh, felt that the assistantship opportunities at Florida State were more diverse and engaging than the other place I was looking. Um, so that is inevitably why I ended up here. My philosophy has always been, again, you're going to get very comparable educations no matter where you go. They're all going to prepare you very well to be a professional in this field, in my opinion. Um, so I, I went really with fit, uh, like how I, the vibe, and that's how I ended up, uh, kind of at Florida State, and that was, again, my process of choosing, um, a place to go. Why did I apply here? One of my mentors had, uh, recommended it. She was a, I used to work in housing. I was an RA, um for one of the Greek housing uh, facilities at Virginia Tech. And my uh, supervisor said, here's where I applied. I think you might like these places. And I said, okay, I'll apply there. Um, and then I did. So I was not super picky in my process until I got to the place. That's all I have, I think. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I appreciate hearing your story. So, yeah, like, <laughs> so, um, so on my end, I guess I'll start off with the things I was looking for specifically. The first thing I was looking for was fit, similar to Charlotte. Um, I don't know if she can remember this at visiting days, but I didn't really talk to many people because I was too busy taking notes on my phone on what I liked and didn't like because I was very, very intentional and very serious about can I actually feel like I belong here? Um, just based off the general vibe that I'm getting from employers, other students, um, even passer buyers, um, like general things like that. So I was very much taking notes on all those types of things. 
Uh, and the second biggest thing, which is honestly probably the first biggest thing is cost. Um, so I was very, very against paying for paying money for a master's degree. Um, I've always been that way. And Florida State will pay you to get your master's degree. So that was like one of the reasons why they ultimately ended up on my list. Um, I also applied to a number of different places that also offered tuition remission. So that's the key term that's usually used, tuition remission. And uh, I got into all those places and I visit, visited some of them. And um, although I thought like in terms of employers, I got a similar vibe. And if I went to those other places, I also would have ended up in conduct anyway. But um, here at Florida State, I kind of feel like there was an opportunity that was kind of like a I would be pushed like to my full poten potential, but also be giving a number of resources that I don't think I would have gotten at other institutions. And that was more so how the faculty at Visiting Days were very much welcoming and they actually approached you. It wasn't like a, you know, oh, like we are faculty, we have X amount of credentials, you come talk to us. It was very much like they did not see themselves as above you. And that's something that I really appreciated um, because as someone that wants to like learn from, someone of in a position of power seeing that sense of humility is very important to me so that also talked to me that also told me a lot about the character of the people who are actually here specifically in our program within higher education as well um, so in terms of an application process uh, I heard of Florida State through my supervisor as well as my supervisor's friends um, and they're all like very high up in higher ed like dean and uh, deans and above and I kind of thought, well, if I'm getting a general consensus that Florida State is a good program from deans and vice presidents of student affairs, then it probably is a good program. Um, so I ended up making my list um, when I was compiling it. And um, yeah, and then all the, everything just kind of like fell into place as I was applying and visiting. And I'm glad that I chose to come here because one thing that I never thought I'd be doing is like getting me really involved with academic writing and scholarly research. And Florida State even offers an opportunity for you to do that. I've already published something and I never would have thought that would have been the case coming out of undergrad. And I definitely probably would not have gotten that somewhere else, at least not as readily available. Um, and I'm kind of going out of the by saying that, but I think that by coming here, I was more likely to actually get that opportunity. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for sharing about your journey and bravo on the on the getting published like that's awesome. Um, sorry, I get really excited. I need to calm down. Sorry about that. So um, I know we have a number of students who have asked us a little bit about some of our classes. And so um, we have an intro to student affairs student development theories, higher education in America, basic understandings, which is a little bit past, a little bit present, hopefully a little bit future of higher education. Um, we do have also um, two internships, two internship classes that students are expected to take and practicum class. Um, Charlotte and Allen, can you tell us a little bit, I know that practicum was very different for your year because, you know, COVID. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about what practicum looked like for you all? So when, it, so I know when I was applying, when everyone kept saying practicum, I was like, what are you talking? Like, I don't know what that means. So what that is, is kind of, uh, <laughs> it's a class that we take over the summer where during the standard year, uh, a more normal year. Uh, we would travel to a different city in Florida. So maybe Jacksonville, maybe Orlando, um, maybe Tampa. We don't, I don't think they usually go further away from that. Cause if you don't know, FSU is kind of located in the armpit of Florida. Maybe not the best way to sell Florida state, but like, if you think about it, it's kind of that. Anyways, um, we don't go further south than that is all that I was trying to say. But we go to one of those various cities and we visit a number of different institutional types. So Florida State is a large PWI, so primarily white institution, research R1, I believe, um, institution. 
So this gives us an opportunity to see a little bit more about how a private college may work, how an HBCU may work, community colleges, et cetera, et cetera. These different Carnegie classifications, if you're familiar with what that means, it's just kind of, again, the different types of institutions that are out there so you don't only get experience at a PWI. Um, we're trying to be an HSI, which stands for a Hispanic Serving Institution. However, that's not the case right now. I'm trying to be very clear in all of these acronyms. If I use something and I don't explain it, please just send something in the chat and I'll try to clarify it. But anyways, so it's a week looking at all these different institutions that is required. All students must do that. Then there is an optional opportunity, usually just the week following, that is an international practicum experience where we go to London and kind of do the same thing in London. So experiencing an, how an international, what, what higher education internationally looks like um, and different institution types and such, again, at the international level. Um, Alan, I want to leave some things for you to talk about. So I don't know if you want to hit on kind of what it ended up look, looking like this year slash would probably look like next year, um, if you want, or I can keep going. I just want to include you. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so I can generally talk about how it looked like for us this year, which I don't think it will look like, look like this in the future. Um, fingers crossed, just because uh, ours is very much COVID unfortunately. So basically what our professor ended up doing, and she did a fantastic job of doing that and trying to make it the most out of a bad situation. I'm very grateful for that too, because I actually was able to learn some things from there, um, especially since she didn't have much time to make the class into a virtual component and things like that. But uh, basically ended up being over Zoom, of course, but she did a number of interviews. I want to say maybe between 15 and 20 of different people in different positions. So ranging from entry level all the way up to vice president of student affairs and everything in between um, across different institutional types. So community colleges, private institutions, four-year institutions, large, small, public, private, et cetera, across different spots in the world. So like Latin America, Asia, Europe, US, et cetera. So, Basically, it was, it was pretty much somebody different. It was always a person at a different institutional type in a different region at a different location, whatever. It was, it was pretty consistent all the way around. So you were able to actually learn about how higher education works at those different institutions, depending on the laws that that particular country or state or et cetera has. Um, so we met synchronously, I uh, believe weekly, just to kind of like generally talk about um, a couple of institutions and really practicum is more so for you to learn about different institutional types because although you may go to like, for example, I went to a small private liberal arts school, I might not necessarily be confined to work there post-grad. So it's good to get exposure away from that school as well as my current R1 four-year institution school because I might want to work at a community college or I might want to work at a uh, mid-size, four-year, moderate research activity institution. So because of that, you have to be aware that these exist, but as well as how things look there, because unlike Florida State, not every institution is concerned with rankings. So you have to see what other institutions might be priorities, such as like providing opportunities for first-gen students. Um, and that's why they might appear lower in the rankings than others. But that's how I practically ended up looking. I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thank you both for sharing your experiences on that. Um, I know that for some of our, our interested master's potentials, um, you're probably wondering a little bit about the assistantship process. And so our goal is to make sure that everybody who comes to Florida State has an assistantship. And we do that through visiting days. Uh, visiting days will be virtual this coming year in February. Um, we are moving towards the back end of February, and it'll be a Thursday through a Saturday. And if you give me one second, I'll make sure I get the dates. Um, I do want to go ahead and make sure everybody knows that um, our goal is to make sure it's a 20-hour assistantship. Part of that is because of um, the ability to, to, like, have a living wage in Tallahassee. Um, but our GAU fought really hard, and so our hourly pay is 20 hour, uh, $20 an hour. 
So I think that that is an important piece to note because um, our GAU has been like busting their behinds, if I can just put that on the recording, um, to make sure that we have a living wage. Um, Tallahassee does not necessarily know it's not Miami when it comes to rent at times. Um, Charlotte and Alan, if I could ask you just really quickly, um, thank you, February 25th. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so it'll be the 25th through the 27th, Thursday through the Saturday. And then GAU, thank you, Alan, is the Graduate Assistant Union. And so they're the union who fights for the rights of the GAs um, and TAs and RAs, not like housing RAs, but research assistants, <laughs> TAs as in teaching assistants. I'm telling you, alphabet soup, y'all. Sorry about that. Um, but Alan and Charlotte, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a master's student um, here in Tallahassee? Just like a little, little bit. Uh, I can go first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so Florida State, our master's program is cohort model. So that means that you take all of your classes together um, for the most part until you start getting into, you know, your um, electives and stuff in the second year. And then um, your assistantships, you might be working with some different people um, in your offices. So you're kind of around the same people a lot. Those tend to be a lot of people's um, friends. So uh, it can be really close, but also sometimes you can need some space, I would say, if I'm being real. So I got involved outside of the program as well. Not that there's anything wrong, just like if I'm doing all of one thing, I'm going to burn out. And I know that about myself. So I needed to get involved in some other ways. Um, so I balance my time kind of between class and my assistantship and my internship with some of my hobbies that are outside of the program. Like I attend a local church and I'm pretty involved in that personally, but if that's not your jam, that is also fine. I know that kind of comes across as like a stereotypical Southern thing, which is if you want that great. And if you don't want that, that's also fine. Um, and ways to kind of engage in both of that. But um, and then I advise um, the sorority I was part of in undergrad. So that, that's kind of how I got involved outside of it. Tallahassee is an interesting city, which I know the word interesting can mean kind of good and bad. So, I mean, we have to address the fact that we are in the South. So there are going to be some, some interesting people, um, but it's also the capital. So there are some also interesting people on the on the other side, but that that's a piece of it. You can find kind of, I would say, most of what you would be interested in doing somewhere uh, in, in the city. I don't know uh, what you would add to that, Alan, or if that's what, she, if that was good, Kendra, if that's what you wanted me to speak to, but um, kind of, again, it, there's a lot of outdoorsy things to do, and it's, and it's interesting. It's kind of the vibe that I get. Yeah, and, and a lot of things that Charlotte said are definitely true. Uh, so I'm basically just going to talk about, like, I guess, what it's like for me being a master's student in Tallahassee. Um, generally speaking, it's fine. I think that our assistantships do a, generally a pretty good job of actually keeping you at 20 hours or less. And um, generally speaking, but if you feel like they're going over, then of course have that conversation with supervisor and reach out to Kendra because it's very illegal. So I'm very, I'm someone that's like, I will never ever work more than 20, period. Like my email goes on mute at 5 p.m. every day and it's on mute in the weekends. That's just me. That, that's just because I've set those barriers. Um, but everybody might not have that luxury. So being able to draw the lines uh, where you see appropriate and some people like love to incorporate the personal life of work. So it's whatever works best for you. I'm not one of those people. Um, but um, being a master's student is okay. So you'll have like three classes throughout the week. Um, they're usually seminar based. So three hours long as well. And uh, you, your assistantship hours will always work around your class schedule. So you will never like work and be in class at the same time. Um, and the classwork is pretty much generally about, it's, pre, it's pretty balanceable um, because like all your professors also know you're in assistantships. And uh, some of them will even have you like share to the rest of the class, like generally what you do in yours and kind of go back and forth and various things like that. 
which is also pretty cool. Um, but the deadlines for like your, uh, for your uh, classes could potentially vary. It is usually on whenever like your actual class day is, usually at like midnight of that same day, just when like a assi assignment is due or whatever. Um, but the workload in which they give to you isn't anything ridiculous, but it's actually something that does have you reflect on whatever material that you have been reading, as well as things that might be happening like in the current world. Like for example, um, an assignment we had to do for practicum was we had to talk about a current issue within higher education and kind of like write about it. So like mine was on like how states are responding to COVID-19, not states, how institutions are responding to COVID-19 within the state of Florida. I only did that because it double dipped into the thing I published with my other professor. So it was easier work for me because I already knew what I was talking about. But like to give you an idea, sometimes those things can double dip depending on what you're doing. Um, and Charlotte added some extra things she's involved with, so I guess I'll do the same. Um, I'm not involved in much else besides being a student and doing my citizenship, but that's because I chose to be removed in my graduate school studies just because I was super involved in undergrad and I wanted to see what it was like to not be involved in that. Like in undergrad, I was an RA, I was also a student athlete, and um, I'm in a fraternity. So like, I and I was president of that for two years. So I wanted to take a step back. Um, and that's just, that was just my, that's just what I wanted to do. But um, I am part of a fellowship program here. So I kind of do like extra things on the side, such as like trying to make our um, course syllabi more socially just, uh, which I did do last month. So I do like small projects like that with our program chair on occasion. But other than that, you know, I kind of go with my own hobbies, which include like fitness, video games, walking around, because it's very outdoorsy here. So some things are very, very beautiful to see, but Tallahassee has something for everybody, but it also definitely is an interesting city, one side and the other. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte and Alan. Um, I know Alan has to run because he has something at 7.30 and it's 7.28, so I will not keep you, but I did just want to say thank you, thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. Um, folks, we can give them a little round of applause. Much appreciated. Um, and thank so you all that, for having me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, if you um, need, have any questions for Alan or Charlotte, um, might you all be willing to share your Twitter, Twitter, twi Twitter, Twitter handles? Yes, I will. I'll put it in the chat. All right. I don't have a personal Twitter, but I run all of the FSU higher education social media. So if you're interested in getting in contact with me, you can follow our Instagram page, our Twitter, our Facebook. I run those things right now as part of my internship, which is also kind of why I'm here right now. So I'll add it there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Alan. Bye-bye. Everybody have a great day and stay safe from COVID. True story. Um, so I know Charlotte is going to stay for our Q&A kind of portion that we're going to have um, when the, we introduce our faculty. So um, again, if you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but we're going to transition just a little bit um, into talking a little bit about our doctoral program. Um, and so I, it's, it's going to be me and Ricardo. And so Ricardo, if you would um, introduce yourself with your pronouns, where you're from, where is your assistantship, and a little bit about your journey here, and then I will do the same. Sounds good. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ricardo Prita. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am originally from Long Island, New York. I attended undergrad at Gettysburg College, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I then served for two years with AmeriCorps. I did a year uh, with City Year in Milwaukee. And then I did a year uh, as an AmeriCorps VISTA uh, at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Um, from there, I went to grad school. I went to the University of Florida in their um, student personnel and higher education program. And then I worked at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire for two years. I was with uh, their residential education program. Um, so I was there for two years. And then um, by that point, my GRE scores had was, you know, on its last legs about to expire. And, you know, I was at a job that I really enjoyed, but I also knew that I wanted to eventually go to a PhD program. So I decided, let's just apply and see what happens. Um, when I was going through the process of applying, um, my main focus was really trying to find a program 
that would allow me to um, get, the, get the experience and skills that I did not have currently. So I knew that I had interest in being a faculty member at some point, um, or at the very least, try to get experiences in research and teaching, two things that I had less experience of at that time. Um, so that was my main focus when I was applying. And, you know, I, I, as I said, I already went to UF for grad school. So I, I was trying to stay away from Florida because I had already experienced it. And I also had a concern about experiencing a doctoral program that I felt like, okay, this is a very similar school to UF. So would that potentially look different than having an experience of a doctoral program in a complete different institution? So there were some concerns there, but um, what drew me to Florida State um, were a few things. First um, was the financial piece. So uh, I received a fellowship, which uh, was kind of the starting point of like, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, and I got that fellowship or at least received the offer for it before visiting days. And so I decided to attend visiting days virtually um, to kind of gauge the program, see how things were going. And during that experience and through my conversations with various faculty members, I realized that um, they were really going to be there to sort of help me achieve my goals. I've been very outcome driven from the get go and that's still the case now. And so I really wanted to make sure that I had the flexibility to do exactly what I want to do. Um, I knew I wanted to do research in something that was important that felt um, relevance, um, something that was timely, something that was going to actually, in my mind, um, lead to an impact. Um, and, you know, uh, Dr. Perez Feldner, who's one of the faculty members here, um, she was doing a project related to housing insecurity with college students. And so that was really interesting to me. Um, and then I also, um, again, wanted to make sure that I could get experiences with conference proposals, with publishing, with all these different things. And I also was getting that side um, from the other uh, position I received was uh, with the Leadership Learning Research Center. So my fellowship allowed me some flexibility, which was really helpful. Um, so right now, I work in the Leadership Learning Research Center, uh, where I get to teach undergraduate leadership courses, which is really awesome. Um, I also am currently in the process of trying to design some courses, um, have helped assess some courses and also doing research related to leadership development. And then, as I said, I'm also working with Dr. Chris Felkner um, on another project related to food and housing insecurity. Um, so I really get, get that opportunity to kind of work with multiple people. And, um, you know, on one side, I get to advance some qualitative uh, data analysis. On the other side, I do some quantitative data analysis. Um, and so that's been really cool and sort of what drew me to Florida State and has been what kind of has kept me going the last uh, year and a half almost now um, since I'm a second year. I don't know if I mentioned that second year. This is my second year in the program. So um, that's a little, little bit about me. Awesome. And then a little bit about me. Again, hello. My name is Kendra Bumpus. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the higher education GA. So um, I actually am a Midwesterner by trade, as I like to say. Uh, I'm from the rural area of Illinois, so not Chicagoland, but like dead center of the states, and did my undergrad at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Um, go Salukis, haha. Uh, and then I went to um, Ohio State for my master's program. And so um, I was, while there, I was a GA in housing. I kind of got my start in like student engagement through housing and had a 12 year long career in university housing before coming back for my doctorate. So I worked out at Arizona State and then I worked at Clemson and then I came here to Florida State actually to work. And I was an assistant director in university housing here for a number of years. So if you look up my name in Florida State, you might get redirected to housing, but I promise I'm with the program now. So <laughs> just to put that out there. Um, for me, I, I am a third year and I took my time coming back. Uh, I did have to retake the GRE because while the GRE is waived currently for the master's program, um, it is not waived for the, for the doc program, but we're working on it. We're working on it, y'all. Um, but uh, 
I did have to take the GRE and that was okay because I needed to get back into student mode. And so one of the nice things that Florida State does is if you're a professional um, and you've been at Florida State for a year, you can actually take some courses and it's called an employee waiver and you can transfer in, I want to say three or four classes into your program. So I, I, I maxed I maximized that opportunity. Um, and so I've, I've actually ca I came in um, with about a semester of coursework before I even got into the program. But because I had 12 years in housing and because housing is what I want to study in my thesis, um, I knew that I couldn't continue to work in housing because it didn't, at least to me, make sense to be in the same space that I am trying to critically think about. Um, and so I looked at all different kinds of opportunities. And so I went through visiting days, just like everybody else. Um, luckily got picked up through the program. So I get to work with all you fine folks um, and, you know, welcome incoming students and work directly with students, which I hadn't done in probably around a decade um, because of my other opportunities. I hadn't worked with undergrads necessarily or, you know, people who are coming in on the student side. So um, for me, I was looking at a doc program where, kind of like Ricardo was saying, I could do what I wanted. Uh, <laughs> um, not, not to be that person, but I wanted, I knew what I wanted to study for my dissertation, and it's kind of niche. Um, I want to study physical aspects of residence halls and how they impact students. That's not something you're going to find everywhere. And in my search for trying to find doctoral programs, I actually had a couple of places where I had contacted them and they were like, yeah, we don't have anybody who can help you here with that. Um, Florida State did. And so I was very excited. You know, I take my outside courses in interior art and design. Um, and so if you're not familiar with our doctoral program or even our master's program, I highly recommend that you head to our um, website and under student guide, there's a drop down box and you'll be able to see um, that we have a master's guide and a doctoral guide and it runs you through what your program of study will be in those programs. So it tells you what your courses, what courses you have to take and what courses you get to take. Um, Cause we also include some of our electives in that as well. So I would highly recommend you check that out. And thank you Charlotte for dropping that in the chat. If you need to just click on a button, it is there. Um, but yeah, so I was really looking for flexibility to be able to study what I wanted. And I wanted to be able to take my outside courses, either in art and architecture, interior art and design, something outside that made sense. Um, and so I was able to do that. And I've actually found uh, a really nice space in interior art and design. I have class with them tomorrow. And they welcomed me with open arms. I can't, I can't draw a straight line. And these people are like, yeah, come in, tell, tell us about what, join us. Um, and so it's been really great to find a space and a home, not only in the higher education program, um, but to be so warm and welcomed in this outside space that I feel like I come in with a completely different perspective and questions. And they might sometimes look at me like I have a third head instead of, you know, just my normal one. Um, but I, I do think that they have been, you know, some of the nicest people. So I really appreciate that. So for our program, um, and Ricardo, you please, you know, jump in here. But, you know, I, I went the, in the doctoral program, you can do qualitative or quantitative. Um, but they make you do both first, which I really appreciate you get an intro to both, so that way you can make an informed choice as to which one you wanna do. And to me, that was really important. Um, I am not a numbers person. Mm -mm. I mean, I can balance checkbook, don't get me wrong, and I can definitely do a key audit, for sure. But I am not uh, numbers, and I'm not good at numbers, but they taught me how to run Stata, and they taught me how to run in vivo. And you know, my courses do those kind of things, which, I never, I mean, if you don't know what that is, you're not alone. I didn't either until this program. Um, <laughs> Ricardo, what were some, what are some of the favorite classes you've taken? Um, hmm, favorite class. So I would say um, going into, so my mentality generally, even like getting my master's in higher education, working in student affairs, and now in my doctoral program, 
I'm always been a bit big about potential. I've never been wanting to kind of like narrow in on one thing specifically and only focus on that. Um, so even going into this program, I had a general sense of what I wanted to think about, but like, you know, everyone likes to ask you for at least doctoral um, individuals of like, what's your, what's your research interest? Like, what's your question? Things like that. Um, and the first semester we, we were able to take um, a lot of really good foundational courses, one of which was uh, student development theory, which at first I was adverse to because I had already taken in, ma uh, you know, in my master's program. I was like, why am I taking this again? Um, and actually the way that um, it was taught kind of let us think about um, theory in a different way, which led me to um, my area of interest now, which is um, low-income students and social class identity. Um, it was during that it was during that class where I realized that there was a lot of holes to fill and was something that now has been something I've been progressing. Um, another class during the first semester was public policy, and I really appreciated that we were able to take it. Um, the program has moved in a direction where in the past there were specific tracks that um, one would choose. And now it's kind of been more open to, you know, taking policy courses, taking um, student affairs courses. Um, and again, policy wasn't something that I was really looking into at first. Um, but during that class was when I, you know, got to learn about a lot of really cool things, specifically college promise programs. And that's something that is in the news all the time, essentially like free college and all that stuff. Um, and learning about that has now, that's something that I'm, I've been looking at. I've, I wrote a paper for it, um, and a, I just submitted something to a journal for it. Um, so again, another topic of interest that I didn't think about before. And so now everything that I try to, um, do in all my other classes are related to social class, related to, um, low income students and thinking about those things that I really hadn't thought about before. So I really appreciated those classes, um, both because they were interesting and I think they set me up well for um, my future that has been the case. And Ricardo, what is something that surprised, I, I know you said you're coming from University of Florida, so you might be familiar with the Florida school, but what was something that surprised you about Florida State? You know, what in coming here, what's something that you were like, huh, about that? <sighs> Yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, and I really, in many respects, I really don't think that anything has necessarily surprised me because, um, again, I was fortunate that I was able to ask a lot of questions leading into um, my time here. Something that I will say um, that I didn't really experience in my graduate program that is something that's a bit more prevalent here and something that I, I would encourage you all to think about is like, additional financial aid, specifically scholarships and other grants and things like that. I think um, when we go into graduate programs, especially in student affairs, the focus is always assistantships. And that's super important um, and something you really wanna make sure you do. But at least when I was a master's student, I had didn't even think about like, are there scholarships out there for master's students? Uh, there are, yeah. Um, and there are a lot of um, scholarships even within Florida states. Um, so this, this has been kind of new in my mind of like, you know, I think the program itself is interesting because it has the Hardy Center, which I'm not sure if Kendra will speak about here, um, but that is kind of this um, bridge to alumni and also a lot of other financial opportunities, which is really cool. Um, and even within the College of Education, there are additional scholarships every single year that they offer for current students. Um, so, you know, I've been able to think about and look into additional scholarships beyond what I received initially. And so I would say, as you are looking into programs, looking into assistantships, don't be afraid to also just consider like what else is out there, just to make sure like, even when you have your assistantship that covers tuition, you still have to be thinking about housing, thinking about food, thinking about these other um, pieces that you might not be considering right now. And so being mindful of really setting yourself up well, so that you can be in a place to like really focus in on the work and accomplishing what you want to. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned about Hardee because there, there are two things that surprised me about Florida State. One was the history of being a women's college. I feel like that is a, an interesting piece that a lot of people don't know about Florida State. Um, we were Florida State College for Women is how we started out. 
And if you, if and when, hopefully people will be able to join us on campus once again. Or if you take a tour, you'll notice that the original um, housing on the east side are all connected. And that's because back in the day, women weren't supposed to go outside after dark. And so in order to go see your friends, they're connected because you went through the hallways. So that way you could go see your friends. And it, it's an interesting kind of throwback to when, um, and you know, Schwartz teaches the history of higher education, but you know, it's an interesting throwback to when women were not necessarily a primary target for, for education. Um, and I think that it's really important that we say like, but Florida State was. And I think that's a really interesting because to me, you can still feel some remnants of that. Um, the second thing is actually the connection that we have with our alumni. And uh, that is through not solely the, the Hardy Center, but we do have the, the Melvin Hardy Center. And she was, she, well, I can't use the language that Michaela uses, but let's just say she was a bad lady, um, but in a good way, in the best of ways. Um, you know, she was somebody who very much was for women's rights, very much um, in the 60s was for social justice um, and for racial equality. And she graduated in her tenure here, she graduated 131, I think, doctoral students, which is amazing um, to give perspective I'm told that most don't do half of that in the time that she did 131 and so you know they they'd created this center after her and in her name because she would keep alumni connected to the current students and so to me that was a really interesting piece and so I'm not saying that everybody who comes to Florida State is automatically getting a job or anything like that however we do work with our alumni base to say, hey, here's who's graduating from our program. As a product of our program, you know what this means. Um, if you see them, you know, come across in an interview, say hi, um, or something like that, you know. Uh, I also think it's really important to note that the Hardy Center works not only to provide funding, um, Oh, yes, sorry, um, to provide funding, but also they, they try to work to help make sure that people can borrow books so that way books isn't a huge cost as well. Um, we are running close to time, and so I do want to say, Ricardo, thank you, and I, I understand you're sticking around for the Q&A session, yes? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, but so we want to go ahead and introduce our faculty who are here tonight. Um, Currently, it looks like it's just Dr. Schwartz, and I think uh, Dr. TBJ will be joining us shortly. Um, but so, Dr. Schwartz, if you could introduce yourself, tell us your name, your pronoun, um, the pronouns you use, and where, what are your research interests? Thanks, Kendra, and glad to join you all this evening. It's been fun sitting here listening for the last 15, 20 minutes. Um, my, I've been here for a good while and my pronouns are he, him, his. I, my research interests include, as Kendra said, history of higher education. I do uh, some classes on black and Latino education and as well as women in higher education, a historical perspective. I also teach uh, one of the introductory classes, higher education in America, which has been referred to by, I think, Charlotte and Alan. Uh, one of the first courses that people take, which is sort of an introduction to higher education to get you going and in, involved in sort of looking at higher education as a, as a field and as a profession, not something that you've been a part of so much, but now stepping on the other side and looking at it from a, from a scholarly and research and practitioner perspective. So that's a quick synopsis of what I've, I, it was fun to sit here and listen to, uh, to the discussion about practicum <clears throat> because before Dr. Guthrie, I taught practicum and it was, it sort of handed off every, seems like every decade, somebody takes over from somebody else. So we, um, it's been, a, it's a great experience and it's a sort of a, a pivotal point in the master's program in particular from where you take everything you've learned in the first year and sort of begin to really make sense out of it over the summer and then come back in the second year with a much different perspective than you had previously. So I'm glad to answer questions or just continue to jabber away at whatever you prefer. 
I do want to ask Annabelle if that's Frank Lloyd Wright in her picture, but down here on the Zoom yes. at the bottom. Yes, it is. I, I used to work as a tour guide at the Frank Lloyd Wright Center at Florida Southern. Florida College. Southern. Yep. That's one of the places we've been on practicum before, too. So that's well, awesome. Greetings to you and Frank both. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Dr. Schwartz, I do have a couple of questions that I know students sent us specific to faculty. So we'll let okay. you get started on the Q&A session. So the first question I'm gonna ask you is, um, what are you looking for in students? What do you see, what do you wanna see in personal statements? Um, how important is a personal statement to the application? Um, can you tell us your perspective as a faculty member who makes those decisions? Sure. Uh, the personal statement is an opportunity for us to get to know you on paper, which isn't the same as getting to know you in person. But at the same time, it's a chance for you to sort of tell us who you are, what you're interested in, what your interests, your aspirations are, why you want to be a graduate student in our program. Um, those are very helpful to us in sorting through grades and test scores and other kinds of things and even references from people who know you as a student this is your chance to sort of say here's who i am and why i want to i want to come to graduate school at florida state um, it's also an opportunity for you if you think there's some areas where you might not be as strong as you would hope or you may have some concerns about things that's a great opportunity for you to sort of share some of those issues with us to a degree, to the degree you're comfortable and just say, um, I had a little trouble in my freshman year as an undergraduate, but I pulled out of that and I finished strong or things of those nature, which I think it's, it's, an, it's an introduction of who you are and what, you, what you're capable of, what you're interested in and why you wanna join us. We've, we've gotta make a decision because once we admit you as a student, we're committed to you as a master's student for two years or as a doctoral student for, mm -hmm. right Kendra? For, for a longer period of time, uh, generally three to four years. And so the money that we have to share with you, the assistantship opportunities we have for you to help fund that experience and for doctoral students, as, as Ricardo said, you know, the, the opportunity to, to find fellowships and other things we need to know who you are and, and, and what your aspirations are and how we can help you achieve all that. So that's the personal statement from my perspective. Fantastic. And Charlotte, I think you make a really good point. Do you want to verbalize what you wrote in the chat for folks? Sure. I was just, Dr. Schwartz was um, not that Anyway, he was saying, you know, a place where you can talk about what you want to do. And I was like, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do. I didn't know when I applied. I didn't know until I had taken a couple of classes. So don't feel like you have to have this pretty little box um, that you want to do for the rest of your life. You could also speak to, you know, your experience, what experiences you're looking for and that you're just kind of on the path trying to figure it out. And I think that that's completely valid too. You don't, this isn't a program where it's like, okay, if you wanna be a student conduct coordinator, this is where you come. That's not, that's not the program. Fantastic. Um, one other question that I had seen coming in um, was somebody had asked about GRE. And so I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to make sure that people knew um, due to the COVID situation, we are not looking for GRE scores from master students um, for this year. If you are applying to the doc program, you do need to take it. Uh, but uh, please do know that, again, if you're interested in coming here for master's for this incoming year, um, the GRE has been waived. So. Yeah. Um, and the GRE right now is a, under a lot of debate in higher education in general. Um, so we're sort of at a, at a tipping point one way or the other. In some programs, it's still required and expected. Uh, I think one of the issues is, is to some degree even social equity. It's an expensive proposition. I used to always suggest to students who are applying, you know, think about taking it two times because the first time you're just scared to death and by the second time, 
you got to you got it managed. But the expense of the GRE anymore is just prohibitive for many students, and it's uh, it's, it's not something most people would sign up to do. I've yet to meet a student who goes, "Oh, I'd really love standardized testing. Could I take another, please?" Um, so I think. Right now, the graduate school is not requiring it um, for, for master's degree in particular, and we're actually uh, in, uh, in a process of arguing with them about the doctoral level as well, but that's not, that's still out there. So if you've already taken one, and one is, that's great. Um, but if you haven't taken it yet, um, not a necessity at this point. And so those were the, the pre-planned questions that I have. And it looks like we've got time for one or two questions if somebody has questions. If you don't, I don't want you put, feeling like you're put on the spot, but. I'm on the spot. Like... No question. I know that PhD program is in person and the EDD is more online. Um, with the EDD, do you have any options to take in-person classes? Um, is there any overlap allowed with that? The EDD, as we have done it up to now, has been in person. We're moving it slowly but surely to the online program. And that program to move through students through in a structured three-year program, which is what we commit to, there really aren't any in-person variations off of the, the track. So it will be, it has been, but what we need to talk about is how it will be uh, when you apply for the EDD. People have the numbers that we've seen, and I was department chair when we first started the EDD or trying to get it approved. It was the first completely online doctoral program in the university, um, and it has become enormously successful. So that doesn't mean you can't be here and participate. Um, but we can talk more about that as well. Right now, the EDD has been in person. It's moving, I think, pretty much to it to the online mode for the future. So, the P the PhD will still be face to face. So, wonderful. Thank you. I've heard great things about the classes that have moved online. I've had several peers that have have taken them and loved it. So, thank you for clarifying. Sure, you're very welcome, and thank you. We're Kendra and I are, are struggling with our Zoom and Canvas skills online this semester, and it's, for the most part, going pretty well. But I feel you. I teach synchronously, so I, I get you. it. Yeah, I accidentally yeah. met just I really, in breakout yeah. rooms yesterday, uh, last class, and I, I ended the Zoom. I'll say I've actually enjoyed it. I came... Um, I worked 20 years in corporate America and I used, I lived on Zoom um, three days oh, a week God. from nine to five. And so um, I was excited to be back in academia and, and teach in the classroom and obviously COVID happened. Um, but I've okay. actually enjoyed being online more than I thought I would. There's, um, there's parts of it that are really very in, engaging, but it's just not the same as walking into the classroom and seeing Charlotte sit in her chair. And, right. <laughs> well, I'm blessed, right? I volunteer with some RSOs on campus, so I still that's, get that student engagement. Helpful. So I yeah. think that that pairing is, what, is what's allowed it to be okay. Yeah. The whole university has had to pretty much shift to Zoom this fall, and people are just getting what they refer to as Zoom fatigue, which is just being online all the time, which also I think means people forget to not work all the time. So it's sort of continuous. On that, on that same vein, we don't know what spring is going to mean for Florida State at this point, so I do yeah. want to just throw that out there. Uh, but I will say that, again, if you're interested in our program, um, our Florida State visiting days, we're thinking about a different title, but that will be um, a virtual visiting days. So you will be able to um, have interviews and that kind of stuff all online. So just want to put that out there. Yeah. If, if I was a betting man, and I, and I am, <laughs> I would bet that we'll be pretty much online for spring, too. I don't, uh, it started last summer, um, and I don't see any way that we can really convert. They really made it difficult to teach anything face-to-face -face this fall and into the spring as well. So unless you're doing biology or, I don't know, nuclear energy or something that you have to be physically in the same room, you're you're on the Zoom. Well, it is eight o'clock, so I want to be mindful of folks' time. If somebody has a burning question, please feel free to jump in now. 
and I'll be more than happy to respond to questions as well as Kendra and, and any of the people who've talked to you tonight by email, um, shoot us a line. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions and talk about the program at length. Or not at length. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not seeing any additional questions. So just to wrap up, I want to thank everyone for coming. And I do want to also remind folks that we have um, two more live stream sessions that we will be doing. Um, one is October 29th. Um, and the other will be in around mid November. Uh, so that date is TBD, but be on the lookout for it. Uh, on the 29th, we're going to go over our academic program expectations in a little bit more detail. And in November, we're going to talk a bit more about um, life in Tallahassee and what does it mean to be a grad student here. Um, again, as somebody who comes from a small town in the Midwest, I, I was like, ooh, Tallahassee's a city. And my friends who come from like Atlanta or like as they say, actual cities are like, you mean the big town of Tallahassee? <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit more about that then. Um, but again, uh, last but not least, uh, I also want to make sure that I remind everyone our application is due December 1st. And so um, application December 1st, and then virtual visiting days at the end of February. So keep those dates in mind if you're looking to apply. Um, thank you, Ricardo, Dr. Schwartz, Charlotte. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for coming and being part of our live stream. We so much appreciate it. Um, and we hope you all have a good rest of your night. Thank you.